welcome back to Tom's Comedy Club. Yes, we're back on Tom's Comedy Club. Now, if you've noticed, uh, Tom's Comedy Club has uh, been varied, yes. Well, today at uh, 6.31, uh, which won't be when you see this, uh, it'll be, well, well, you'll see this after because that's how time works. Because uh, that's been scheduled to Well, that's the final episode of Series 1 of my radio series, Nonsense. That's currently airing on University Radio, but also airing on YouTube. Then there'll be something of other things. And we'll be back with more uh, weird comedy bits that makes no sense to either you or me. So there'll be no more me pretending to be a small child that hijacks a plane, uh, making the noises wee wee and, and nothing, just on your own. It's weird. But today we're back with more interviews. Yes, we're back with more interviews. Yes, we are back. Joking apart is back. My podcast that will be uh, more bigger than Stuart Goldsmith's. Um, don't don't sue me, Stuart. It's not your idea. It's it's uh, me trying to improve on your idea, but failing at the same time. Who knows? Who knows, Stuart? Just just don't sue me. But we're here today with a very special guest. My guest is best known for having his special uh, not so long ago release on um, the YouTube channel of American Company, which I think, if I pronounce it correctly, is eight hundred pound gorilla. But I, I uh, could be wrong. Uh, it's a company that is now going more British than American, and my guess is more British than eggs and spam. It's wonderful. Stuart Law! Hello. Thanks so much for having me. And to give it a proper, uh, you know, American label uh, greeting. Good day there. How are you doing? And so we'll start at the beginning, not the beginning of the universe, but the beginning of uh, comedy itself. How did you mm. get comedy? I was a friend of mine who I did. I used to host uh, like talent shows or like silly things like at our youth group with him. Um, he did comedy at university and he said to me, Stuart, you should give it a go. I didn't go to university. And I was like, oh, I don't know anything about that. Um, and then another friend saw an open mic in the nearby town that I lived and was like, Stuart, you know, you mentioned about doing comedy. There's an open mic here. You could go and do it there. Did it. A couple of friends came and watched. They laughed loudly at bad jokes and annoyingly the the seed was sown. Because that's all you need is you just need a couple of laughs and you're just like, oh my God, I want to keep doing this. Yeah. Doesn't matter how bad you are, how bad the audience was, how bad the setting was. You go, I want to chase that little laugh for the rest of my life. Yeah. And now, what, we're almost 20 years later. <laughs> And when you joined the comedy circuit, uh, mm. what was it like when you joined it? When I joined it, it was way more um, just straight white men doing it. That was absolutely the, the vibe. Um, there was not as many people doing it at all. It really was like, I think like the new act competitions, there was one that was called the Laughing Horse Competition, which I entered in, I think, I think 2008 was when I first sort of, I would say I started doing it on and off properly. Um, and 2008, there was like a few hundred uh, entrants. And then even just like four or five years later, it was like almost a thousand entrants or something like that. So it sort of absolutely skyrocketed at the same time as live music was sort of going downhill in Camden yeah. in those sort of late 2000s, comedy was coming in and replacing it. And what was uh, it like filming your recent comedy special? Well, so I'm in an unusual position where I am a, a director and a comedian. And so my I run a production company that makes comedy specials and works with comedians. And, you know, I've also worked on like the development of shows with comedians, you know, the live show and then directed the special as well, um, which are two different jobs. Um, and so doing my special, I was like, right, well, I know I want to do it in a nice place um, where I know I'm going to have a nice crowd of people who want to see me. So I asked um, my friend Henry Widdicombe, who, along with a bunch of other people, runs the fantastic McCunthleth Comedy Festival in Wales. I was like, I know they hadn't had a special filmed there before or one that had gone out 
publicly. Yeah. Um, and so, and he said, yep, absolutely. And then it was my job to sort of get the crew there um, and not only sort of manage all of that, but perform this show that I had done in 2019 at the Edinburgh Fringe in 20, late 2021 to do my Soho theatre dates and a couple of other little dates that I hadn't been able to do. And then in mid 2022, record it as a special. So it was like this weird thing where the show had started life in 2018 and didn't get filmed until 2022. And the show changed over that course. And I had to sort of keep re-remembering it. And, you know, I would say the warm up show I did the night before the special was yeah. better than the actual special record. Yeah. Um, because of the special record, I was a little bit distracted. We were using like, um, replacement sound alike music so that we could put it online um somebody in the audience was in the wrong show they had tickets to another show and then accidentally come into mine i knew i only had one shot my eye was filling up with i believe pus at the time um the next day i woke up and it was stuck together um and i had some sort of sty that had exploded um so it was a stressful sort of time recording it um i would say that i didn't enjoy the actual performance that was one of the least i've enjoyed the performance i'm happy with the final outcome yeah. but you know i it, it's too much to going on so i'm filming my new one in june and um we are going a bit larger scale on that where i don't have to be running around setting stuff up i can do it in the evening yeah with ian smith who's a fantastic comedian and we work together loads and we can just sort of enjoy it a bit more rather than running around at a festival with an eye that's about to explode yeah and do you reckon that because the way your special and more specials by the same company worked do you reckon that you've got a larger audience because the people that paid to see the the, the special before it went live on youtube do you reckon that your audiences have grown because they've seen your special oh yeah 100 percent. and like you know um, the my special hasn't had like groundbreaking numbers but like you know the, you know some some specials go absolutely viral some you know you know do real good solid numbers some of people have got a real big fan base i'd say my fan base is um um and there's a core that's like it's really cool is a small core that i'm like right great they they come to like loads of shows they really interact then i have quite a disparate gang of people who follow me from different social you know you know media accounts who are like like one thing that i've done or have seen me on something or of you know they're not necessarily fully committed, but they're like, oh, he's there. Oh, I know that guy. I'll go and see him. And the special, I think, definitely helped solidify a bunch of those into being like, oh, that's a proper legit thing. Um, I think the special really benefits from being watched all the way through in one go, which is, you know, some specials you can start, you can watch 20 minutes, come back to it, you know, and so on. It really is sort of a um, little um, trick box that is sort of, folds in on itself that yeah. re sort of relies on people watching it in one go which um i'm hoping my my new special is a little bit more isn't quite as tricksy it's a bit more sort of a straightforward tale which is uh you know, i'm looking forward to filming that yeah and because you you said that you were a director and, and you work with Ethan, do you reckon it's uh much better from your perspective that word will come to me eventually <laughs> better from your angle uh, directing other people's specials because you are a comedian yourself and you know you, you know what 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 it's like doing that and how you, to get the be best out of it yeah i think it's really interesting seeing people who don't work with comedians all the time come in and work with them and like really talented directors and i'm not saying that they do it badly or anything like that there's so many talented people out there but like there is like a weird like underspoken non-spoken like language of comedians when when you've been through it yourself you know what it feels like to be side of stage waiting to go out whether that be to 50 people whether that be to a thousand people that you can sort of key in a little bit more you can sort of you know you there's not so many steps to take to be understood or to help sort of make things easier for them yeah. And one of the things you've done that uh, has been, well, it, it was on both TV and radio, but the radio version has become more successful and the TV version needs to return. What would they like directing the incredible 
Um, I'm going to big it up just in case the BBC are watching. The incredible uh, TV version of what just happened. Oh, yeah, really. I, it, so we were uh, so excited to do that. And it was the first um, panel show that I've directed. And it was sort of like a situation. We were making that and three stand-up comedy um, episodes at the same time in the same place. And it was very much a, here's, here's the budget. Can you do all of these in one go for this money? And the main thing we wanted to do was like, can we, is this show funny? And can we, you know, is there some sort of visual stylings and stuff we can do with it that that is indicative of what we would do if we got a full series and we could do it in a proper studio, in a proper panel show setting. Yeah. Um, so it was sort of like a halfway house between a live show and a panel, like a studio panel show. And it was so fun working on that development. We we did so much for that show where that didn't get anywhere near the edit. There was like VT elements that were so funny and like really great comedians, um, live sketches that were in it of like, um, of some fantastic acts. And all of them were so funny. And it was such like a difficult edit because we were like, we want to include this and this and this. Um, but we've got 28 minutes and I think the, the show ran to like two and a half hours. Yeah. So we're cutting out so much. Um, and it, yeah, absolutely love doing it. And I'm so glad that the radio show is doing so well because we were basically close to getting a series and then a few like budget rearrangements happened. That meant that we, it got postponed and postponed. It may still happen at some point and with fingers crossed on that. But for now, the radio show is like this, the, the great success story. And do you reckon that if the radio version becomes even more successful than it's already doing, do you reckon that will help the TV version? Because Breaking News, which is a good example, that's doing so well on both radio and TV. Do you reckon mm. that what, uh, what just happened could run the same where it doesn't do uh, a full series like Mock the Week, for instance, it just does it every so often, like it's a special occasion? I, I think there is a world where that could happen and that would be great. And, you know, just... From my personal view, the people involved in that show, like the creatives, like Robin and Henry and Kiri, um, you know, and, and then all of the writing team, there's so much great talent in that writer's room um, that you just go, I hope that it keeps going because that, you know, it's something that is different. And it's like, weirdly, it's broken out of like the traditional sort of TV stronghold of panel shows where it just seems, feels like the same same faces the same talent again and again and again and this is like a really funny show by really great talented people and it's exciting to see something like that break through yeah uh, do you reckon that panel shows on radio do you reckon they're so successful because of the amount of panel shows on tv people want to see a varied collection of different things not just the the same sort of uh type of shows that they see on tv yeah, it's it's good radio. There is more of a chance to take um, a risk is not the right word, but like to take a chance on like lesser known acts who are obviously very good and very funny. And TV can sometimes be a little bit difficult for so many different reasons. And like so many great producers on TV are like wanting to push new people and things like that. But there's like so many different forces at play that radio there's a bit more freedom to be like, I'm going to throw this person in and just, you know, give them that chance. And that often does create such fantastic comedy. Yeah. And one of the things you've uh, appeared in as various different uh, voices and characters in is, is it's a fantastic radio series that's uh, becoming like a, like a wing, it'll fly and it'll, it'll grow and change. What's it like being in the wonderful yet amazing DMs are open? really great i loved doing that um and you know i hope that i can come back and uh, appear in it again and um what i enjoyed about it was that you get all of the submissions from the public which are, are really fun and um you know so i mean some of them are bad but that's also the some of the stuff that professional comedians write is bad bad you know the, the whole point is to keep on trying and to keep putting stuff out um and um, to actually perform it you just you, the actual performing I, I haven't been in the, this series which is in front of a, an audience I was in the one that wasn't in front of an audience um, you just all gather around a table 
reading through these scripts, having a great time, you know, finding, you know, all sorts of different things funny, adding in little extra jokes, playing around with it, but also the writing process of, of it. Like I was given a chance in one episode to do uh, my own bit, which was to do with having a vasectomy and child-free living. And it was really fun to have that freedom to just be like, Stuart, this is like two, two and a half minutes that's yours. What would you like to do with it? And that's a really nice position that you just like so rarely get um, a show where they're just like, well, you're on this because we think you're funny. Yeah. And we, we want to now give you the freedom to do something that you want to do within these constraints. And that's great. Yeah. Why do you reckon that uh, viewer submission type shows on the radio that have been going for years, even longer than news chat because there's one before it, why do you reckon they're so important um, to have uh, available to to everyone? I think from, from a performer writer's perspective, it's really interesting to see what um, comes in and what is like the thought there's thoughts that are going through the public's head. And obviously it's a very like niche area. It's people who want to get into writing themselves. But like so often in comedy, you can sort of get stuck in either your own rhythms or like what the like the zeitgeist is at the moment within yeah. comedy itself. So to just have that break out a little bit is really interesting. And then from the perspective of like, you know, someone submitting, you want to feel like there is a legit way to breaking into these like institutions. Like I did, I didn't know anyone coming into comedy. Like I, I had no idea that the Edinburgh fringe was a thing. I had no idea that like you could do like two gigs in a night. I didn't know how to email people. I didn't know how to get gigs. Um, And so it was like a struggle to sort of like, you know, meet people to work out the rules of the game and to then progress in any way to so to have um a show that isn't gate kept where you can anyone can submit yeah is such a strong and like literally if your sketch just tickles the person that's reading it like it, these aren't like you know business people sat uh, you know you know taking each one and being like no no way it's like a group of just idiots sat in a room having a read of submissions being like what do you think of this one like playing around with it you know it's just really fun and to know that you know you can literally be sat anywhere in the uk live anywhere in the uk send in a sketch and then it be on the radio on the bbc is you know crazy yeah and one of the things you've done that um is is sadly recently announced and it was uh drawing to a close what was it like writing on the comically hilarious the now show now, The Now Show was the first thing I did at the BBC on radio. Um, and it was, I found it quite, when would I have written it? It would have been like back in like 2017, I think maybe. And it was the first um, experience of going in there and feeling like I wasn't just there with my mates and we were just making fun stuff together. It was like, oh, I need to tick these boxes. I need to achieve certain things. So it was quite intimidating. Um but like the producers on that were really good. The producer got me on because I, you know, submitted a packet with like a bunch of jokes and a bunch of, you know, current affairs, sort of pop culture, sort of monologue ideas. And he liked them enough to be like, yeah, come on, let's do, let's do this. And I didn't get anything, a joke onto the show, but I think two of the topics I suggested. So you turn up and you bring like a few suggestions of stories that could be covered and then a few joke ideas, and then you're chatting about it. Then you go away, you write stuff, you come back together at the end of the day, and then the next day you just hone all of those things and send them in so you can do that at home or come into the BBC. Um, and so I was like, oh, I wanted to get a joke in, but to get the two stories in, I was like, okay, so I brought like I brought something to the table, and that's always what you want to feel. You don't want to feel you've detracted. You want to feel like you've added some value. And one of the things you've done in, in recent years is it's a milestone within comedy because it's a, uh, what's the correct word? Because it's, it doesn't lock the gate to live comedy to people that can um, saunter down to a comedy club. What would they like doing the Access Festival for Next Up Comedy? I loved doing 
the Access Festival. And Leicester Comedy Festival um, said that they weren't going to be doing it in 2021. Um, a promoter, Colin Bowles, who runs Triple CP, fantastic producer, promoter, um, he said, I think you should do a show next year. They're going online. I think you've got something. You could do something with you know, all of the stuff that you do online, sketches, all of that. And I was like, okay, yeah, fine, I'll do it. And that led to me sort of coming up with an idea, which was a, a document, I'd say, of about four and a half, five thousand words of ideas and stuff. Yeah. I sent that to Rhiannon Shaw, who's a fantastic writer and a friend of mine. And I said, can I hire you to work with me on this show? Can you work out what I'm trying to do with these, with this essay? And she went through it. She spent a day going through it and was just like, here's this, 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 this. And I was like, great. That has clarified it completely. I went and rewrote it all. She went through, did a joke pass. And we came up with the show, Stuart Law's Single Father of None, which was a Zoom show that was also about like performance and live performance and this sort of like dual split of like doing Zoom comedy is not quite the same as live comedy because you know we're in a box and we're separated and the whole point of live comedy is joining but also played with that form and I used fake zoom backgrounds to sort of pretend I had gone home halfway through the show and then my twin brother was coming in and interacting and there was all sorts of like stuff and it was really fun to do yeah. and could not be done in real life and that's what I wanted to do with the zoom shows it was like well let's use this medium to actually do something interesting rather than just sit and just yeah. chat and um when access festival first ran in 2023 um the other next up one um they wanted me to come and do that show again and it was such a great opportunity to sort of rewrite it update it perform it loved doing that best performance that i did of it really glad to have had another opportunity to do that um and then this year to do it again like was really nice but i was like i've done what i think is like a zoom show <laughs> and now i'm going to use it to preview the do the very first preview of my new show which i i, I had written as like it's like a seven thousand word document knew what it was going to be knew that i could do some interactive elements and play around with it like that but i crucially i what was valuable about it was going i think i know what the audience is going to be here. I think they know who they are. And my show thematically, I thought would be really well received by them. So it gave me as a comic, the freedom to try saying stuff out loud for the very first time that are actually, you know, quite revealing about me and myself as a person. And that's what I think is useful about that. It's created such a nice community of comedy fans who are, open to seeing a comedian try something way more intimate and that is quite nice about a zoom show is that i'm performing and i can hear laughs but i'm also if i'm not hearing laughs it's not because then none of them are enjoying it it doesn't have the intensity of a comedy club where for me i want to hit a laugh every you know six to ten seconds whereas on zoom i'm happy for that to slow down a little bit because i feel like that would be an awful experience of constant laugh sort of ruining the the audio peaks and of everything yeah and um, why do you reckon um from, from an industry standpoint why do you reckon that next up comedy is so important uh for live comedy itself so next up when it started in 2016 i had weirdly said to dan and kenny and sarah who set it up oh i want to film some shows from the um fringe there's a few shows that i was like i felt sad that they would be performed were so good at the fringe and would never be seen again because they're not big enough to get like a tv dvd special or something whatever and i mentioned that to them because i i know they'd been working they, i'd worked with them on their pre on previous projects on various things and they said hold fire because we're working on something and when that when next up started i was like oh they're creating exactly the thing i wanted and that's the chance to watch interesting shows filmed in small clubs um with comics that wouldn't get the chance you know some really great but like wouldn't get the chance to take that show to like a tv special yeah. but are actually some of the funniest things that i've 
seen but for whatever reasons tv or whatever that it you know would wouldn't work or wouldn't get commissioned mm. um and i th- my company filmed i'd say maybe the first 40 50 of the ones on the platform um and it was such a joy to do that what incredibly stressful six months um but like we wanted to create that live comedy feel of being in a room where it could go wrong where it wasn't like a big shiny floor with big sweeping cameras we wanted it to feel in there you know audience in shot you know the feeling of like a comedian two feet away from the audience um because we knew that from my perspective where next up could stand out would be in providing something different to what netflix to what you know rather than a cheaper version of what netflix is doing to provide a completely different experience and the fact that they now do live shows they do online stuff the access festival they live stream so many things that's so exciting because there are so many people that would love to go and see more comedy or that just literally can't and that you know is such a wonderful advancement in technology to allow that and to allow a load of comedians access to a new audience that they maybe wouldn't have got to. And do you reckon that next up comedy is, is uh, like becoming even popular? Because I've noticed recently that, uh, and, and it's an incredible thing that Comedy Central they're airing uh, next up comedy, some of next up comedy's content, uh, and some of like some of some of like the the lesser well known like Alex Beckett King's show. For, for instance, and they're going to do Kerry's new show uh, that recently dropped on the platform, and ITVX are airing a load of Next Up comedy stuff, and so is UK TV and Dave and all that. And do you reckon that's because of how good Next Up comedy is, or do you reckon that's because uh, the industry wants to see more unique things? The, these streamers um, want content, and they want good content, and I know that my specials, I've got two specials on Next Up, have been licensed by like Samsung and Virgin Atlantic and various other like these different streamers that pop up around the world or like services want content. And so what Next Up can provide, and this is what's nice for comedians, is that they Next Up can email you and go like, Samsung would like to option your special and this is how much they're paying. Um, are you up for that? And you can go yes or no. And now your special that you made six, seven, eight years ago can now be seen by a whole new bunch of people. You get a bit of extra cash and you just go, oh, cool. That show is now, you know, being seen on flights across, you know, the Atlantic. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, to, to be able to do that as rather than just sort of keeping it as a restricted, like, no, it's our content and we, are the only ones that get to show it because we want more subscribers to us. They know that like that expands out people interested in comedy that hopefully will then come back to the platform, keeps the comedians happy as well. Yeah. And one of the things you've done recently, and it's, you were, you appeared on a program that's now slowly because of the way awards work, slowly winning awards because it's, immaculate and incredible in deserve seven series what were they like working on the hilarious such brave girls oh yeah cat sadler is so good um you know they are such a good writer such a good performer and i've worked with them for years i actually directed a short film that they wrote along with cameron loxdale who's fantastic and works on what just happened as well um and um what well, yeah that that short film called sad face we worked on together and then since then i've just worked together on so many different things and like cat they showed me the pilot to such brave girls before the series was filmed and like wanted feedback on it and it was so interesting to sort of look at it and just be like you know to give you know they want honest opinions and thoughts and they have their own honest opinions and thoughts and wanted to just make the show as good as they can and the amount of rewrites that those scripts went through are so, you know, so many rewrites um, because they're just in pursuit of perfection. Um, and I think it's such a fantastic series. Simon Bird, the director, did such a great job on it. Um, and yeah, it was really nice to work on that. Um, and, you know, even however small a part it is, and hopefully it keeps, you know, getting all the plaudits and award nominations it deserves. 
Uh, and do you reckon that sitcoms, because of uh, studio sitcoms, were really popular? Do you reckon that these sitcoms that uh, were the BBC are making now are 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 going to be the next big thing? Because sitcoms themselves are are going in in different ways. Do you reckon that the way the BBC are going about making sitcoms are is a good thing, or do you reckon that they could change it up a little bit to make it more varied? Still to say because it's so difficult at the moment to find money and to find ways to get stuff out there. Um, you know, what seems to me is that BBC are taking some more risks on like smaller um sitcom ideas and like lesser known talent. Like, you know, Kat had not been on TV before, had written for the BBC loads with with the on the radio. Um, but to to fully commit to a series like that is so exciting and to um to see that i think a new one was released recently by i, I actually don't know their no i know their uh, instagram handle is chi with a c yeah um um and you just go this is great that like new voices and new talent are getting through and especially like diverse storytelling because as i said when i started comedy it was just straight white dudes and to see what is getting through on TV now, you just go, great. It's so much more, you know, diversity, interests, sort of interesting stories to tell. Um, and for anyone that's got to this point in the interview and, and are enjoying it so much, which you should be, um, have you got any advice for anyone that like wants to start getting into comedy, whether or not that's performing comedy or doing behind the scenes in comedy? Um, it is it is who you know, and it's difficult if you don't know anyone. So it's like looking for schemes, like looking for competitions that you can go to. If you can somehow make some sort of short film or sketch and submit it to like any one of these like smaller sketch nights or comedy festivals or film festivals, and then going along to those and talking to people. And I know that's difficult for some people where, you know, maybe access is difficult or even, you know, things like communication might be difficult. Um, you know, it, whatever you can do to make that easier for yourself so that you can meet people in the industry. You know, I am, you know, lucky that like a bunch of people I started doing comedy with are like, you know, super famous, super successful now. And, that they recognized my uh, abilities and talent and friends, you know, the, our friendship as well. And they're like, we want to keep working with this guy because, you know, we value that. Um, and like, you know, that's uh, what the industry is, is like it's connections based. It's, um, Oh, we need someone to do this. Hang on. I, I, you know, I know Stuart does that sort of thing. And I, I worked with him last week, you know, it's um, the most important, thing is that and you know obviously you need to still have the talent to back it up and the expertise like you only get given so many chances before people go let's just be friends instead of working together all the time so um constantly sort of working pushing yourself being prepared to make mistakes is also very important and knowing that you can then you know learn from those mistakes and make your next thing better and what was it like editing the amazing um stand-up series that should get more praise live from Barry Island. Um, really fun. What was great about that is that's put that's we've done three series. Um, each one's called different. So the live from BBC Wales, live from Aberystwyth Pier, live from uh, Barry Island, and it just was real fun to be able to do a comedy show where they were like, we we want you to do what you want to do with it. And that was like down to like booking the acts. We had like, you know, between us all, we had different people we wanted to get on there. Um, I also just wanted to create the live feel of a gig. And that includes like showing the acts backstage, chatting to each other, walking off stage, the next person coming on past them and encourage the acts to, you know, be live and in the room rather than worried about performing it as a TV show. And so I think there's the you know, Jordan Brooks is set on live at BBC Wales is like um, a favorite of many people. Live from Barry Island, you know, you've got Sakisa, you've got Annie McGrath, you've got Taro on there. You've got like really fantastic acts that deserve to be seen by m more people. Um, and you know, on live from Everest with Pier, you've got Stuart Laws. He makes a little appearance. And, you know, that was a real fun thing for me as well to be directing 
and then to appear on it as well at the same time. And do you reckon that there'll be a, a more version of that type of programme from other areas of the UK? Because I think that's a, a good format to show off local and uh, well-known comedians from that area. Yeah, it would be great to do that because it's so like those three series we put on so many welsh comedians and like even over the course of that that we made that over the course of four years maybe four years in total seeing the explosion in welsh talent and perhaps part of that is that the more opportunities became available the more people knew they had something to work for there was more visibility there was a chance for more welsh acts to do well it becomes you know a thing that doesn't feel as an impossible mountain to climb. So people, you know, the, the quality of Welsh comedy has just got better and better and better. And it's really exciting. There's a Welsh wave tour going on at the moment of fantastic Welsh comedians where you look at the lineups, you're just like, that's a fucking great lineup. And do you reckon that being, having the online medium, uh, do you reckon that helps comedians get uh, well known enough to be able to make appearances on these shows and other TV shows where it allows new people to try out talent. Oh yeah, definitely. I, you know, you can't get good at something if you only ever get chances that are like live or die. You want to be able to go on and just sort of feel comfortable. And to the more you get to do that, the better you can, you can be at it because you know, not every opportunity is, is risking your career. You know, that it's all incremental helping you get better. Yeah. And what was it like directing um, the uh, incredible online series? Because uh, the, the YouTube channel that, that produces incredible stuff that shouldn't stay on the YouTube, should be on uh, the BBC. What was it like directing Turtle Cannon's lectures? Oh, uh, yeah, real fun. That was just a, an idea of just being like, I got a bunch of comedians. We need to, it, weirdly, it was probably a little bit before its time in terms of just going, let's get a comedian on to just talk about a thing they're passionate about. And th there was a series on Dave, I think, called Comedians yeah. Giving Lectures. And we made the Total Canyon Comedy Lectures like four or five years before that. It was just a chance to be like, here's something that you like. Let's just play around with it. You've got like, we've got two hours to film it. What should we do? Um, really fun. And that's what I like doing is working with comics and being playful and exploring an idea and not feeling like it's, you know, do or die. It's like, just let's make a fun thing. Uh, and when you're, when you're working on these things, uh, what, what, how do you find, do you, how different do you find it when you're working on it both as a director and a producer? Do you find it harder or do you find it, it makes your job more easier because you've got more control over it? Um, all of any creative thing is a collaborative experience. And so you've got to be able to trust in the skill set of different people and you want to have pushback on decisions. You want to make sure that like, your input is varied and diverse, but at the same time, you need to have someone who's like, right, I've listened to it all and this is the decision, this is where we're going with it. Um, and so I feel very lucky to have had experience in all those areas because I think it helps me understand all the different perspectives and then try to make a decision from the point of view of the camera operator, from the point of view of um, you know the sound recordist to the makeup artist to the to the performer themselves um, yeah I think just having that sort of broad experience is is very valuable I feel very lucky to have had that yeah and what was it like um, because because of the the way that the, the these specials have evolved and and the way that the characters in these specials have moved what was it like being a, a voice in uh james one of james Acaster's netflix specials uh really great i was a voice in the live shows of it it's when he plays the part uh the recordings that uh, he records as an undercover cop i play one of the gangsters and for the um it was always fun i supported him on one of those tours like seeing how it went down live and just being like hey, hey i got a laugh for something that i recorded six months ago um, and so, you know, knowing how well those um, 
specials have gone down and how much people love them it feels nice to be a part of that yeah and and do you get uh, recognized on when you when you get recognized on the street or or when when people hear you talking because of appearing in a netflix special oh no 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 not at all especially because it's just my voice um you know i i i would say i get recognized and not you know in a non comedy arena um four times a year and even then it's just someone just being like hey man saw that thing you did that was great and it's just really nice but i would say i'm so desperately unfamous yeah uh, and because of your career ever expanding and getting better and better um what what do you, what was it what was it like when you when you find out that um that your career is expanding because you do so much it's really nice. I feel very lucky. Um, you know, the, you know, I'm friends with a lot of people who have done very, very well. Um, and, you know, it's exciting to see them do really, really well and to work with them on those projects behind the scenes, um, you know, on screen. Um, it's just an exciting industry to be in and uh, to be able to do my shows and for audiences to come to it and to listen and to enjoy it is it, it, you know it's so incredibly valuable and any work I get to do in the industry I feel lucky about yeah. uh, and so we're coming towards the end of this interview now this is your opportunity to tell people where they can find you but don't give away your home address <laughs> oh I've publicly spoken about Ricelip too many times so if someone really wanted to find me they could just hang out in Ricelip for a few weeks until they spotted me um <laughs> But otherwise, if you, I would ask that you don't do that. Um, <laughs> but I, um, my website is stuartlaws.com. I'm on uh, Stuart Laws Comedy on most social media, apart from X, which is dying anyway, so it doesn't matter. Uh, and I am currently on tour. Um, I'm on tour until July the 11th um, and have a bunch of dates going around the country of my last show, Stuart Laws. Is that guy still going? And so there you have it. Another fantastic interview now you can see more amazing interviews amazing things i create because i'm everywhere and you can never get rid of me i'm like i'm like a creepy doll in a horror film but a not a doll b not creepy and c not in a horror film so uh a win is a win anyway guys thank you guys for watching and remember this is tom's comedy club so remember there's other things you can see me on so i'm everywhere you can't get rid of me